Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to begin this evening with what sounds suspiciously like a pair of deep philosophical questions, but I assure you is no such thing. Why am I here, and what is my purpose? Now, these aren't simply a first-person expression of a broad existential query. Rather, I mean, why am I specifically, specifically here? What is the purpose of an introduction to this specific film? The commonsensical answer would be, I suppose, something along the lines of, it's designed to provide the audience with a way into an unfamiliar and challenging film. This answer imagines the critic as a kind of trailblazer, clearing all sorts of knotted vines and treacherous growths out of the way so that the audience can get a clearer view of the film in front of them. All very good, all very helpful. Except that Black God, White Devil isn't an ordinary film, if such a thing exists. And indeed, this isn't an ordinary season of films. This is revolutionary cinema. And the arsenal of revolutionary strategies at the service of a filmmaker include images and sounds which are unconventional, unfamiliar, shocking, confusing, disorientating, unnerving, perplexing, unyielding. Such images and sounds abound in Black God, White Devil. And if the critic has taken as their duty the task of tidying these up, of arranging them in a neat order, of, heaven help us, explaining them, then the revolution becomes a past tense event, something that has ended and can now be talked about reasonably. Instead, I urge you to approach this film as a continuing revolution, a film that can still confound and outrage, that can remind us what cinema can and usually doesn't do. I found watching the BAFTAs quite interesting this year. Inserted into the typical self-congratulation and performative gratitude was a more interesting discourse, one which engaged with our political moment as a divided country in a divided continent in a divided world. Ken Loach, winner of the first award, gave an impassioned speech about the urgent need for a political cinema that reflects the experiences of the disenfranchised. And so it went on for a little while, as a limited series of politically engaged films did well. But then, La La Land began its inexorable rise to premiere position as most awarded film. And as though embarrassed, the film's victorious personnel began to peddle an argument that La La Land, in providing a little light in a naughty world, was significantly political. Now, why do I relive this unedifying moment? It isn't because I have anything particular against La La Land. It's because its success shines a spotlight on the kind of Hollywood-style complacency which also gripped Brazil and the world back in 1964. Force-fed a diet of North American film style, Glauber Rocha, director of Black God, White Devil, argued that nothing is foreign to us because everything is foreign to us. From the 1940s, the Brazilian studios of Vera Cruz and Atlantida turned out escapist fare, including the well-known musical burlesques or chanchadas. Carmen Miranda and her improbable headgear was only the most internationally recognized of the stars of this studio system. But meanwhile, millions of Brazilians lived lives of intolerable privation starving, with no prospects of meaningful work, greater comfort, or social progress. As the film tonight depicts, this hopelessness, coupled with a sense that political action was futile, made messianic cults and banditry seem like good options. This lumpen proletariat had no cinema of its own, until the late 1950s, when Cinema Novo, Brazil's new wave, a loose affiliation of directors and styles turned its attention to this hardship. Foremost among this new generation of politically minded filmmakers was Glauber Rocha. 
From my positively geriatric viewpoint, the fact that Rosher was a mere 25 when he made Black God, White Devil is incredible. He was, as perhaps befits any new waver, an angry young man. And his anger was directed squarely at both the historical and contemporary colonialist practices, which had been, and were still, devouring Brazil. Rocha viewed Hollywood as an instrument of colonialism. Let me get it straight for the last time, he writes. Decolonized films are ones that refuse to copy the American model and that attempt to remake national cinema on the basis of our true cultural roots. Before Cinema Novo, from the colonial viewpoint, poverty was made to look exotic. From the colonized perspective, poverty was shaming. Films like tonight's set out to change that. In 1965, months after the release of Black God, White Devil, Rocha presented his still startling manifesto, An Aesthetic of Hunger, to an audience in Genoa. In it, he argues that the European audience fetishizes the Latin American hunger, transforms it into an exotic and extraordinary object to be savored and enjoyed rather than felt in all its horror. But he insists that his new cinema won't allow this fetishization. Rocha is unequivocal when he writes, from Cinema Novo it should be learned that an aesthetic of violence, before being primitive, is revolutionary. It is the initial moment when the colonizer becomes aware of the colonized. Only when confronted with violence does the colonizer understand, through horror, the strength of the culture he exploits. As long as they do not take up arms, the colonized remain slaves. I wholeheartedly recommend the manifesto to you. It's short and written with a kind of political directness which is never bombastic despite its anger. There is a kind of pride as he describes the films of the movement as sad, angry films, as screaming, desperate films. And it is this screaming desperation which we do well to listen to attentively today. The film is beautiful, but it's an ugly beauty, one which is scorched by the sun, untidy, confused. The narrative is familiar, tapping into folkloric heroes and the ballad tradition, but it's an unfamiliar familiarity, made strange by shocking juxtapositions and opaque motivations. The characters are rich, but it's a shallow richness in which psychological realism is hard to plot. Abrupt scene endings, overlapping editing, jump cuts, disjunctures between sound and image, these techniques beat an unstable rhythm through Rocha's masterpiece. Now here, we may detect shades of the great Soviet filmmakers. Rocha described Eisenstein and Vertov as both friends and enemies, though their anti-Hollywood, anti-illusionism stance certainly inspired the cinema novo. Like Eisenstein's great experiments in montage in the 1920s, Black God, White Devil collides images with startling results. But Eisenstein's theory suggests that an active audience will make sense of his dialectic montage. Image A, Eisenstein argues, will be collided with image B, and their collision will trigger a thought in the viewer's mind. Two depictable images combine to make something greater than the sum of their parts. A concept, what Eisenstein called the ideogram. The most famous example, perhaps, is from Eisenstein's strike, in which shots of workers being fired on by soldiers collide with shots of a bull being slaughtered, expressing the idea of a ruthless bourgeois regime assaulting an exploited proletariat. The images in Eisenstein add up to an argument. In Russia, things aren't always so tidy. These are screaming films, remember, despairing films. They are, as Jeffrey Noel Smith puts it, exercises in political pessimism. Rocha's editing creates collisions which do not explain or resolve the horror, but unflinchingly show it. In 1980, just a year before his death at 42, Rocha wrote that Cinema Novo disturbed the international critics that seek the typical coherence of the rich cultures. The film's revolutionary quality doesn't lie in its legible expression, 
Quite the contrary, it is revolutionary in part because of its challenge to legibility. Which is not to say that it's sloppy. Not at all. The character of Sebastiao, the black god of the title, a wandering cult leader, is associated with vertical tilts of the camera, gesturing up to or down from the heavens above. Kurisku, meanwhile, the bandit and white devil, is associated with more earthly horizontal pans. These decisions show careful planning. But ultimately, like the contradictory character of Antonio das Mochas, who both works for and against the corrupt church, both kills and liberates the people, the film is ambivalent and hard to read definitively. So, what is an audience in central London in 2017 to make of this Brazilian scream? Penelope, Penelope Houston, reviewing the film in Sight and Sound, wondered what a film so locked in its own oppressive landscape can really communicate to a European audience, other than the seduction of alien violence and alien despair. I think she's right that it's easy to be seduced by the shocking anecdote that lead actor Geraldo Del Rey carried a real rock as he crawled up a mountain for some of the film's most memorable scenes. It's easy to be seduced by the overwhelming horror of images of rape, infanticide, and massacre. It's easy to be seduced, as European film festivals were in 1964, by the Latin American strangeness of it all. But I think that we would do better to resist the charms of some questionable exoticism. Instead, I urge you to watch the film with Rocha's words echoing in your mind, the most noble cultural manifestation of hunger is violence. The hunger and the violence in Brazil weren't over when the film was released, and the military coup of 1964 followed hot on the heels of the film's completion and just preceded its release. In this coup, the military had the support of the US in its overthrow of a democratically elected left-wing president. And today, over 50 years later, Inequality remains the defining feature of societies the world over, including our own. I want to introduce the film only so far as to argue that it isn't primitive or exotic or tawdry spectacle. Rocha's bewildering, strange, inconsistent, incoherent, maddening, ugly, sad, despairing, revolutionary film is a continuing scream. Enjoy your time.